Thank you so much both to the Noor Foundation and to the New York Academy of Sciences for, uh, for having us. Um, I will, in a moment, I'll introduce uh, the speakers to you. But first, I thought I'd reflect a little bit on today's theme. Of course, it comes from Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. And Descartes has become a bit of a whipping boy in discussions of the self for two reasons, really. You've probably heard these before, but I'll remind you of them. The first most famous one is his claim that the mind and the body are two completely distinct substances, of course, leading us to wonder how the two could ever interact. And he was frank that he didn't really, hadn't really figured that one out. We won't belabor that which is now known as Descartes' error tonight. There is another one closer to the heart of what we're interested in today, another error which Tim attributes uh, Tim Wilson to uh, Descartes at the start of his book, uh, Strangers to Ourselves. And that's this, or purported error. The purported error is that Descartes thought that our thinking and our sensing was always transparent to ourselves. That is to say, thought is conscious, our sensations are conscious. We can see, we know what's going on in ourselves insofar as we're thinking. And you might think, well, that seems a pretty plausible when I'm thinking something. I must be doing it, and I must be conscious of my uh, doing it. And we'll get to the bottom of Tim's criticism of this in a moment. But that's not to say that Descartes thought that um, we were entirely transparent to ourselves. And I just want to give you a little... Uh, uh, Queen Christina of Sweden pressed him on the first issue and made him admit that he didn't really know how the mind and the body interacted. Um, and uh, she also asked him another question, which brought, brings us to the unconscious and Descartes' thoughts about the, our unconscious desires. She asked him, how can it be that what causes us, she says, to love people, fall in love with people, before we have uncovered their merits? And Descartes said, that's a very interesting question, and he gave the following answer from his own experience. He says, when we experience a strong sensation, this causes the mind to crease like a piece of paper. You can imagine the brain creasing. Not the mind, the brain. The brain creases, and when the stimulus stops, the brain uncreases, but it keeps, it stays ready, so to speak, to be creased again in the same way. And uh, when a similar stimulus is presented, then we get the same response because the brain is ready to crease again. And what did he mean by all this? Well, he gave an example. He said all his life he had had a fetish for... Um, cross-eyed women. Whenever he came across a cross-eyed woman, he would, you know, desire would inflame him. And uh, he figured out, he said, after introspection, that this was because his brain had been strongly creased by the first, his first childhood love, who was cross-eyed. Now, what's interesting there is, so he says, there was this unconscious desire moving him quite strongly, which through introspection, he figured out, he became conscious of. And then he said, once he became conscious of it, it stopped. He stopped being immediately falling in love with cross-eyed women. And those are three interesting things there in, the, uh, in this example, I think. The first is that uh, we have these unconscious desires. To some extent, we are strangers to ourselves, but... We can, at least in this case, through introspection, become aware of this factor in ourselves. And then step three is, by bringing it to awareness, insofar as we don't want to be moved by this factor, we can switch it off. At least this is a story of success in that respect. Now, tonight, I think we're going to look at challenges to this aspect, quite familiar thoughts about um, our unconscious desires, as well as looking into the question whether we can, um, whether everything we do, including th that we think, is conscious. And um, some of the challenges involve the, the following questions. Uh, firstly, what is the nature of the unconscious? Um, is it like the Freudian unconscious that we've all heard about, or is it rather something different? Uh, second question is, how can we come to know ourselves, our hidden motives, our hidden thoughts, 
is introspection, the thing that Descartes engages in in this snippet of a conversation with Queen Christina. Uh, is that a good way, a reliable way? And many of our panelists have challenged this. And um, the third question is, uh, if we try to gain this knowledge of our unconscious self, what is it good for? Is it, is it good? In Descartes' case, it was good, but might not be so good in, in every case. Maybe, uh, as Jack Nicholson says, I think, at the end of A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth. You want the truth? You can't handle it. Uh, we all know of bits of ourselves or people around us that we'd rather not have brought to consciousness, or they might rather not know about themselves. So those are three uh, questions about the nature of our unconscious, how we can find out about ourselves, and third, whether it will do any good uh, that, um, that we'll look at. And let me now briefly introduce the people uh, who we have here to discuss this. Uh, first, uh, Timothy Will, uh, Wilson, professor of uh, psychology at the University of Virginia, author of the book Strangers to Ourselves, which focuses on um, basically the three themes that I, uh, I just outlined. Fascinating uh, book, and the subtitle is Discovering the Adaptive Unconscious. I'll be asking him some questions about that. Uh, then we have a philosopher who's very deeply interested also in uh, psychology, David Jopling, uh, professor of philosophy at York University in Canada, uh, written a beautiful book on self-knowledge and the self, in which he, among other things, explores how we come to know ourselves. And he argues that introspection and um, uh, also uh, therapeutic sessions that you've all been paying so much for are a pretty dubious value. Uh, and that instead, we should have a, form, a different form of dialogue. So I'll be asking him some questions about that. Um, then there's uh, Eli During, uh, associate professor at the University of uh, Paris West, uh, uh, Nanterre. To, I think in, in one word, Eli is an omnivore in philosophy, uh, because uh, he's written in the philosophy of science, uh, then also on um, uh, questions of uh, self-knowledge and, uh, uh, well, at least to me, in the questions of ethics in, um, uh, uh, in Bergson and uh, James. Um, basically, one of the key things I want to question him on tonight is that he's, he said, Ethics is a self-transformative process. That's to say, you come to know yourself in order to make something of yourself, to change yourself. And that is some of the things I'd like to question you on tonight. Uh, finally, Francis Kahn, professor of philosophy at Harvard, uh, one of the world's leading ethicists. And um, I would almost say I could recommend, but you, you, know, you have to have the stomach for it. Uh, or two-volume morality, mortality, uh, and uh, following that intricate ethics, and now ethics for enemies. That's what it's called? Yes, ethics for enemies, terror, torture, and war. This, the last one is the toughest one. Uh, 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 and I think Frances is known beyond her contributions to ethics for a distinctive method, uh, a method of doing ethics, which is, I could, if I could sum it up rather roughly, introspective. She imagines herself in a particular situation, a moral case, asks herself, how would I respond? And then tries to uncover the reasons why she's so responding. Now, that's an interesting method, but it seems to be challenged by some of the other speakers here tonight. Okay, so those are the, uh, our speakers. And um, shall I just uh, start right out? Yes, with the first question. So, Tim. Maybe you could start us off by helping us to understand what is, we all understand unconscious desires, but what is unconscious thought? Well, uh, as with most things, it depends how we define it. So if we mean by thought the kind of self-talk that we're all used to doing and engaging in, then almost by definition that is conscious. But research psychologists over the past few decades have really expanded their view of the uh, extent to which our minds operate unconsciously and the kinds of cognitive operations we can perform out of view, such things as 
as learning new material, detecting patterns, uh, filtering information as it comes in, even such higher order processes as setting goals for ourselves, uh, combining information to reach decisions, all of these things which we used to think were the uh, performed only by our conscious minds, there's gathering evidence that these things can occur unconsciously as well. And you conceptualize this unconscious as you call it the adaptive unconscious. So what does that mean? Well, partly to contrast it with the Freudian unconscious. And I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not denying that there may well be a Freudian unconscious, a repository of instinctual urges that we do our best to keep hidden in the basement of our minds. Uh, the point I want to make is that there may have been a much different kind of unconscious as well that probably evolved earlier in our evolution as a species than consciousness did. The ability to transform information and, and um, think in, in ways that further our survival, hence the term adaptive. I think this kind of quick sizing up of the world, uh, interpreting information, deciding how to act can happen very quickly and, and outside of conscious view. And it's not something that's, that's buried because we don't want to know it. It's part of the architecture of the brain that is unknowable, I, I would argue. So un unknowable, that seems to say that uh, you know, what Descartes was engaged in, trying to figure out the reason why he uh, had this fetish for cross-eyed girls, uh, it seems to be an impossible exercise. Well, uh, there are various metaphors for introspection, and, and I, I think the Descartes example is an interesting one. Uh, you know, one metaphor for introspection is it's like a flashlight that we're shining in the dark, and, and we sort of flash it in the corner and discover that crease in the brain that he just hadn't bothered to, to see before. Another that Freud was fond of is introspection is archaeology. We're digging and, and digging up things that were buried deep, deep down below our minds, but if we dig hard enough, we'll find them. I think the, the metaphor I prefer is really introspection is narrative building. We're constructing stories about ourselves based on some access to desires, but, but, but not, not much, I think. A lot of it is the way we would construct a narrative about somebody else, um, observing what they do, uh, bringing our vast cultural knowledge to bear. And I'm not so sure that isn't what Descartes did in this case, that, that he deduced almost as another person might have, ah, this is the the tenth cross-eyed girl I'm attracted to, and, and I remember that one. So maybe that's, so it may not have been shining a flashlight or digging deeply. It may have, he just inferred this based on his self-observation. So you're saying we figure out about ourselves by imagining how somebody else would look at us? In part. I, I think that's actually not a bad way to try to do it, is to see our uh, see ourselves through the eyes of others. That's, that's a difficult thing to do, to get outside of our own heads and do that, but I think that is one interesting path to self-knowledge. Hmm. One of the things that struck me when you said that we create a nar what we're trying to do is create a narrative about ourselves. A narrative brings to mind the thought that there is, you know, we're just storytelling. And uh, there's some examples that you, you mentioned, I've also heard mentioned, it, it, uh, to, to illustrate this narrative capacity of ourselves, um, psychologists uh, hypnotize people and then get them to do absolutely crazy things. I think in one case, put a lampshade on the head of someone else who was in the room, right, and kneel in front of them or something like this. Quite interesting why you would choose that as to suggest to your experimental subject. Um, but uh, then the people who were in this situation asked why did you just put the lampshade on the head of the other guy in the room would come up with a story saying oh I just thought we should have some you know lighten the mood here a little bit um, but that's the claim is that's confabulation yes the, the, the very striking examples of through hypnosis uh, uh, brain damaged patients and others who who clearly can't know exactly why they did what they just did but um, are very fluent in, in describing reasons that they seem to truly believe that, that are the reasons, that, that we seem to have this capacity to, uh, seems to be very important to us to, to have a, a narrative as to, what we, as to why we are doing what we are doing, and we're very skilled at, at uh, constructing it. Mm. And uh, David, I thought might, might bring you in on this point. Um, this idea of constructing a narrative 
uh, you claim is what happens in a lot of therapeutic sessions, right? But you don't seem to be so sanguine about the idea that we can just, that a, a narrative will do. <coughs> no, I, I'm, <coughs> I have some reservations about the, uh, the so-called talking cures uh, or the exploratory psychotherapies where the goal is insight or self-knowledge. And uh, <coughs> if you look closely at the interpersonal dynamics in uh, a psychotherapeutic or a clinical psychological uh, situation, there is a huge amount of pressure on uh, patients or clients to produce the sorts of insights that are expected of them by their therapists or psychiatrists. Um, <clears throat> there is also a, a very strong expectation for them to comply with the doctrine uh, it's called doctrinal compliance. Uh, comply with the doctrine or the theoretical orientation of their, uh, of their therapist. And if they don't, well, they're not good patients. And there's a, a lot of subtle <coughs> cues and pressures, leading questions, suggestion, uh, to get them to see things as their therapists are wanting them to see them. Um, <clears throat> and one of the high points in the talking cures, such as psychodynamic psychotherapy, Freudian analysis, uh, and narrative psychotherapy, there are a number of uh, psychotherapies that, uh, where insight is one of the highest goals. And uh, the uh, therapists at certain high critical points, turning points in the uh, therapy, offer interpretations to the clients about what their problems are, about what their unconscious looks like, uh, their Freudian unconscious, um, about their, the various pathologies from which they're suffering. <clears throat> and these interpretations, they're garnered from, generated from hours and hours of clinical material that have been collected by the therapist. But they're very powerful uh, frameworks for patients to think about themselves and their problems. And it is expected then that the patients develop insights that more or less conform to these and confirm these interpretations. Uh, <clears throat> and the insights that clients acquire are vivid, they are intense, the clients often have very high levels of conviction about them, but uh, uh, my question is, are they true? I don't know. Does it matter? Well, sometimes it, it does not matter because uh, these insights trigger therapeutic uh, improvement. Uh, it, it generates more clinical material. Um, uh, they can be adaptive, very helpful. Clients feel good about them. And yet my my interpretation of that, some of these insights are placebos. Uh, they are the psychological equivalent of a sugar pill. Um, they're missing some vital ingredient. This is the nature of placebos. They're missing active medicinal ingredients. They're, they're uh, empty pharmacologically. Well, the psychological equivalent is uh, what is missing? And I would venture that in some cases, not all cases, I'm, I'm not generalizing right across the board, but in some cases these insights are placebos because they're not truth tracking. They're not true. They're false, but they're adaptive, they work, and they, they uh, bring about some degree of therapeutic improvement. So, uh, if I could just jump in, yeah, I agree with most of what you said, except perhaps the idea that truth is the ultimate goal. That I, there are many versions of truth about one's life. Uh, and many narratives that, that might fit it that, that make sense of it for a person. Uh, in fact, the data on psychotherapy of which I'm aware show that, that psychotherapy does work for many problems. What's interesting and not inconsistent with what you're saying is the theoretical discipline, uh, very different kinds of psychological therapies work, and the key predictor of whether they work is whether the client buys into the belief system that, uh, of that therapy. And so I guess the only place we may differ is does that mean it's somehow false or not helpful or, or placebic, 
Or is it just that we all crave a narrative that we believe in and can help us make sense of our lives and, and move beyond our problems? I, I tend to think the latter. Mm -hmm. Eli, Eli, you and I were discussing this before, and you said, well, you know, if it works, it must be true in some sense, no? Well, the intuition is that if it works somehow, then it means that you've hit upon something. But uh, to come back to the general question, the one which you raised and Richard raised uh, earlier, which is why should we care at all about you know, knowing ourselves? Well, I, my, my first answer would be, for, it's not very clear what we mean by knowing. Well, the self is one thing. We decided not to uh, raise the general question, what is the self? But I'd like to raise the question, what do we mean by knowing, by knowledge? And from the various examples we just uh, had, uh, it's clear that, I mean, it, it can mean you know, a wide variety of different practices, different actions, operations, from uh, locating in your memory one particular event, this is Descartes in The Cross-Eyed Girl, and kind of weirdly relating that to a crease in your brain, or we would, today we would, I think, speak of a synaptic path or something, mm -hmm. um, to uh, the therapeutic um, relationship, um, and also could be uh, the kind of self-modeling process, unconscious mostly, that's going on in any learning activity, these are very different ways of relating to yourself and very different ways of trying to know something about yourself. I mean, it's, and, and I don't see uh, how you could be interested in knowing yourself in general, you know, uh, if self-knowledge covers all these very different activities, I don't see what it means really. So what I'm interested in, uh, and I'm speaking for myself, when I, when I grapple with the, the problem of self-knowledge is, well, what do I get personally? And my intuition is that if we are interested in the first place in knowing ourselves, it's because we want to change something about ourselves. That there's something in us, in ourself, uh, that is not very satisfying, something that must be transformed. So uh, in my view, um, the, the proper reference frame or the, the perspective, the context we need to make sense of self-knowledge is ethics, basically. Mm. Ethics. That would be my answer. Now, I can imagine not just wanting to know myself in order to change myself, but just in order to make a big life decision. So uh, should I stay with my girlfriend, yes or no? Do I really love her? Now, that's not necessarily about me wanting to change myself, but just really wanting to know, uh, is this the person for me? And uh, what struck me in in um, at least some of Tim and, and David's work, is that me sitting in a room thinking deeply about whether this was the person for me is probably one of the worst ways I can go about it. Uh, why is that? I mean, you, you, why is that? I mean, I've, I've done a lot of it lately, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what have I been doing wrong? Why, why is it so unsuccessful? Uh, perhaps we shouldn't go there. But, but, uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be about me. Uh, well, I, I think there's only so much that gazing at our navels can accomplish. And, and I think um, uh, being acute observers of ourselves, there's increasing evidence in psychology that asking our friends, our friends often pick up on things about us that, that we don't. Mm. Um, and, but I think, you know, as, as Descartes was, just being very good observers of how we're reacting and what those circumstances are and what seems to trigger joy and, and love and what doesn't um, is perhaps better but than the naval game. you ask yourself besides, uh, mm. you know, how do I feel about this? You, you look at certain objective factors such as uh, uh, do we enjoy being together? Uh, do I feel satisfied after having spoken with this person? Uh, do we share the same interests? And these are more objective things than simply how do I feel? Uh, will there be conflicts because uh, I want one thing and this other person wants another thing? Uh, surely, if you're not looking at those things, you're looking at the wrong navel. I mean, <laughs> you know, there are lots of holes in the body, and uh, it seems to me... <laughs> Right? Uh, that there are these more objective factors that we've referred to. Uh, that will tell us or help us decide whether you know, we're in an appropriate relationship or doing the right thing in our own lives on our own. No, it's yeah. true, but I thought that the, and this, the example might move us to some of your cases in ethics. So one of the things that uh, Tim claims, uh, at least as I understood from your book, is um, look, 
there are a lot of things that I want and think and believe that I can't articulate. No matter how hard I think about it and, and, and try to introspect, I can't figure them out. One way of figuring them out is imagining myself in a situation, place yourself imaginatively in a situation, and think, imagine how you would respond. And uh, that's a way of kind of gaining indirect access to our, our subconscious um, desires and thoughts. Now, so in my case, the question might be, does your heart leap up if you imagine spending the next 10 years with this person? No, bad. But here's how I thought it, it linked to some of your, your cases, uh, Francis. So just for those of you who, who aren't yet familiar with uh, much of Francis's work, it involves uh, a methodology in, in looking into ethics, which involves placing yourself in a given case, seeing what your intuitive response would be when you really imagine yourself in that case. Uh, and then trying to figure out through introspection what the reasons are that driving this judgment. Am I mischaracterizing? That's right. Okay. That's right. I'm uh, mischaracterizing. That's right. Well, how about you take over this? Well, the thing is that, um, you know, as I was uh, reading, uh, you helpfully gave me some of uh, Professor Wilson's things. And uh, I thought, uh, there's a lot here that I agree with. All right, so l let me just tell you the sort of cases that I imagine that I'm discussing. They're like thought experiments. Uh, they're like scientific ex experiments done in a laboratory where you can hold all factors constant and alter a variable, just one variable at a time to see the effect. You know, scientists still do that, I assume, right? So uh, uh, the thing is that, of course, you're just imagining, right? So philosophers of my stripe, analytic moral philosophers, are, spend a lot of time discussing this one case which has been made famous called the trolley problem. Okay? So there's a trolley headed towards five people that's going to kill them. And a bystander could turn the trolley onto another track, away from the five. All right? But then, unfortunately, there's a one person on the other track who'll get hit and be killed. And the question is, is it permissible to do that, to turn the trolley? So here's an imaginary case. It's not like I'm there, standing there. Okay? There's another variant. There are thousands of variants. These are all like little thought experiments. This is what he means by saying that I think of myself in a case, all right? So the trolley's headed towards the five in this other variant. There's someone standing on a bridge over the trolley tracks. If you push that one person in front of the trolley, it will stop the trolley and save the five people from it. May you do that? Now, many people say, and here the question is, I haven't done surveys. This is another part of the method. You think about it. I think it's permissible to turn the trolley away from the five, though it will hit the one. I do not think it's permissible to push the one person over in front of the trolley, even though, again, one person will die and five people will be saved. So what's the difference? All right, why do I have this intuitive judgment? I make a judgment about right and wrong. And I, this is supposed to be an objectively true judgment, mind you. It's the sort of judgment I think you should agree with and you should agree with and you should agree with. It's not something that's just expressing my own, you know, personal point of view. Any more than Professor Wilson's, you know, views that you've come to hear are just a way of reaching into his soul and understanding him. He claims to be talking about the truth about the adaptive You're just giving conscious. us a narrative. All right. now, well, that's the thing. We're not just interested in ourselves. You know, what am I thinking? We want to know whether we're latching on to the truth about the subject matter we're thinking about. And that's the same in ethics. All right? So the thing is that where I agree with Professor Wilson is that um, I do not think, I think, first of all, that a lot of people tell themselves stories. They call it confabulation. I would call it conjectures that are not correct. So, for example, some psychologists have thought that the only distinction between these two trolley problems I've introduced you to is that in the one place, I'm up close and personal to the person I push over the bridge, but not the person that I turn the trolley to. Now, the way you deal with a hypothesis like that is you think, well, suppose instead of pushing the person over the bridge, I had a machine that from a distance I could press a button and it would push the person over the bridge. Do I think that makes it permissible to push him over the bridge? And I say, intuitively, my judgment is no. So when I remove the factor that is presented as the crucial variable between permissible and impermissible, I do not get a change in my judgment about impermissibility, which suggests that this factor is not accounting for my judgment. Now, this is a way 
you know, of teasing out whether a particular fact or a conjecture is correct or incorrect. Similarly, you could do it by taking this factor that people say makes the action impermissible, construct another case where it is present and find, lo and behold, it doesn't make the action impermissible, which I've done also, which is my, why my case, my, you know, I have so many cases. Now, I think that this is like the method that you call access to the adaptive unconscious that is called inference. It doesn't mean that I have privileged access to myself that I couldn't have with someone else because I'm constantly testing, trying out and testing hypotheses about why is it that I have made that judgment, okay? And Professor Wilson grants that you can have access of that sort, inferential. And that's one of the reasons I agree with something else he says, namely that I could have as good knowledge about why someone else makes a certain judgment as about why I do. Because when I see all the people who say, yes, you may turn the trolley this way, but you may not push the man over, if I have explained by this method of inference, considering all different cases, what the crucial factor is, I would predict that they, in fact, would respond to that factor, right? Now, that's why I think that there is some level, degree of agreement here, but it doesn't mean that this adaptive unconscious is completely inaccessible, and that isn't what he's claiming. The interesting other thing that I found was that very often the so-called confabulations that people give, they tend to be quite simple, like this one, well, you're up close and personal, you're pushing the guy over. My explanation of the difference between all these cases, and not only these two, but many others, you've got to get a theory that accounts for all of them, can be quite complex, or it can seem like something like, what? You know, I would never have thought of that. Right? And I was very struck in your book by your, uh, what you called implicit learning. Uh, they flashed certain um, lights uh, or X's right, in various quadrants of a screen according to a very complicated formula. Implicitly, there was learning to uh, uh, adapt to that flashing of lights, so that eventually subjects came to predict where the next X would be. If you ask them to verbalize this complicated formula, what made them do... No, they said other things, simple-minded things that didn't correlate at all with the way they behaved. The actual truth was complicated, all right? And so when the theory that I discover, if it's complicated or not, that that's really what's going on, you know, that's really what is causing people to behave in certain ways or respond in certain ways, I take that as, again, consistent with something that Professor Wilson had said. The, the one thing that I want to emphasize here is that we're not just looking into our navels when we do this as philosophers. When I claim that this is a factor that accounts for why it's permissible to do something in one case, impermissible to do it in another, I'm claiming that that's the truth, moral truth. This is a step beyond investigating intuitive grounds, right? Grounds for intuitions. And that means that it's supposed to be universalizable. That is to say, everybody, no matter how much they differ from me in their likes or dislikes, their upbringing, their interests in life, will have to agree or should agree that this is the way they ought to behave, that there's permissible for them to do this and impermissible not to do the, and impermissible to do the other thing. So there is this claim to objectivity and universality, okay, about permissibility. And that's not just self-knowledge. And my sense is that that's what's really important, to find out that. I would I mean, mean, it's definitely important and I, and I find it highly interesting to kind of, as you do, experiment on our intuitions to kind of dig out the invariant structures of moral judgment. But then my question would be, how is, in what sense is this self-knowledge at all? In the sense, how myself, this particular self that I am, is concerned by this? If, if it's a universal you know, structure of moral judgment, I, I would say that the real question, the ethical question, is why, how is it that I'm not always ready to, uh, to agree with this universal you know, uh, truth Agreed. that you that you, that you unearth. Like, how is it that I I I, I don't always act upon this kind of intu intuition? What what prevents me from actually seeing the moral truth behind these very sophisticated scenarios? And and 
at this point, I think we're touching on an actual problem of self-knowledge. It's why me, as this particular individual that I am, why am I having an issue with these you know, general questions? No, I agree with you that you come back to the question of the self when you, when you see, for example, some people may disagree about the principle, for example, okay? Uh, a given uh, a member of the Nazi party may say, oh, there's nothing wrong with burning these people. Those people, it's impermissible to burn, but these people, it's right to. And then you would want to see, by considering their views, whether you could find faults in their reasoning and who has the correct moral view. But you're quite right. They may say, uh, I don't see your point of view. And then you may just say, well, that doesn't mean it's not correct. You may have reasoned incorrectly. But you will have people who will say, I see that that's wrong to take the drugs but I want them so much I'm going to give in. So we have the personal qualities, the, the weakness of will or the, the, the habitual behavior, okay? And that's the point at which I think we have to consider what a philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, has considered the sort of meta-judgmental self, the self that may stand and see that you have this desire to ignore permissible or the distinction between permissible and impermissible. You want the money, you're going to take it, you know it's wrong, okay? But if there is this judgment, some people will have the, the part of themselves that says, I don't want to be this way, okay? I do not endorse my desires. I do not endorse my predilections, okay? Um, they will perhaps have thought about the matter. And then the question is, can they be put in control? Right? Can that part of the self that judges the other part, right? The trouble is that this may go on because when you're thinking about truth, you may say, are the, you know, the, the perspective from which I do or do not endorse my desires, is that the correct perspective? You've got to check on that, whether that's true as well. So I, the, the thing that, uh, if you can give me a minute, um, <clears throat> that you bring up there, Francis, is this question of us endorsing our desires, I think is one of, if, if I were to answer uh, the question you put to us earlier, um, I'm going to permit myself something mm. as a moderator, uh, why do we care about figuring out ourselves, including our subconscious selves and desires? It would have to be something about self-control, being becoming more autonomous, because I think one of the most unsettling things is when we don't know why we do what we do, or we don't endorse that, uh, the desires on which we act. This is a very disconcerting sense. And one of the reasons one turns in on oneself, I think, is, or tries to figure out by inferential methods what one is like, is to get past the point of lacking this control over yourself, either because you don't know what's driving you or because you do know what's driving you, but you don't want that to, to, to lead you. And Eli, at some point in correspondence, you said, well, is that the, was it Bergson who said that we were in this process of um, becoming a person rather than that we're yeah. just, we, ordinarily we'd say someone is a person when they're, you know, have reached the right age of, uh, of reason? That's if you're, a, yeah, if a psychologist, hard if, work to if you're a, a philosopher, you'd say when you're a moral agent and responsible and so on. Yeah, Bergson had this theory, theory about being in, the fact that it's, it's a strenuous effort to be a person, to maintain this continuous attention, this attending to oneself is something that costs a lot. But I was thinking also of a, another thinker whom uh, Richard referred to, Ostad Allah, he had this very sophisticated, sophisticated notion of the imperious self, which kind of echoes what you were just saying. That I think the, matter, the, the issue of self-knowledge really becomes ethically significant and important when you start differentiating within yourself between different layers or, or I would say levels of the self, a deep level, I wouldn't say authentic, because I don't know what that means, but a deep level uh, and a superficial level, the superficial ego, um, and the, the one that projects a social image uh, to other, this social self that James referred to, and then this spiritual self or deep self or whatever you want to call it. And El Sadilahi has this notion of the, the spiritual self or self-modeling itself, self-modeling its personality, um, as a tension between an imperious self, which is a bundle of drives, imperious drives or urges or desires um, that basically come down to your animal nature, um, and a tension between this imperious self and this higher self, higher level 
of yourself, you call it second order self, uh, I guess, at some point, which is here not so much to establish control. Well, yes, of course, the ultimate goal is to maintain some, some kind of control over this and transform yourself accordingly. But to get something from the knowledge of this imperious self, it's not about crushing your desires or just getting rid of these very annoying <laughs> urges. It's about getting something from it and building virtues upon it, to use this very old-fashioned term that Aristotle reflected upon. Virtues are basically about transforming your passions and desires in a way that's constructive and, and make you flourish as a spiritual self. But uh, I think it's very important to have this kind of self-model uh, in this dynamic tension between two levels of ourselves. And the notion of empirical self developed by Ustad Elahis is a case in point. It's a very interesting way of self-modeling without having any, I think, perspective of you know gaining an absolute objective knowledge of yourself, you know, as as a as a as an embodied uh, pers person uh, uh, or as an unconscious uh, psyche. I mean, these are all elements that are can be useful in the ethical process of self transformations knowing about unconscious drives or motives or um, aspirations but the ultimate goal is not to map your personality in every detail that doesn't make sense again the idea is to come down with a come down with a come up actually with a kind of uh, effective model of your ethical self and this involves i think at some point this tension between two levels, or maybe a first order and a second order self, or maybe a superficial self and something that you kind of identify with, which would be the Tim's deeper. been shifting uncomfortably. I guess. Uh, uh, so uh, with the, uh, both of you. The hour is okay. late, but, but, uh, <laughs> I was thinking back to your girlfriend. No, no. It, uh, uh, to, to go back to something that uh, Francis was saying, I, I, I actually resonated a lot to uh, the idea of these thought experiments, and it's something we psychologists um, do a lot too, uh, but I think there are somewhat different goals. I mean, our, we do think about sitting in our offices doing these thought experiments, but then we go and do the actual experiments, mm -hmm. because the goal for us is to predict what people actually do. Your goal is, I think, somewhat different to what people ought to do. Um, and the trolley example is a very interesting one because I've always wished I could do a real experiment with that because obviously I can't for ethical reasons. But, but, I, but I'm, I'm not sure that, that any of the analyses of, of um, what people, uh, their intuitions about would match what they would actually do in that situation. A face with a split second decision of I can say five lives or one uh, and I can do it this way or that way. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the kind of... Uh, hypotheses we come up with through thought experiments would do a great job of predicting that. My, my mm -hmm. friend and colleague Dan Gilbert and I have done a lot of research on what we call affective forecasting, which is our ability to predict our future emotional reactions to events. And although we're not terrible at it, we do make systematic errors in, in knowing exactly uh, what, uh, whether it really would be horrible to push one person to save five or, or not. These are, mm -hmm. these are predictions that aren't always correct. But when you make See, uh, when you put someone, if you could, as you say, if it were ethical, in this scenario, right, and they push the person over the bridge, the question, as you said, is not resolved about whether they ought to have done that. They may have done it, okay, and they may have done the wrong thing, okay? Mm -hmm. They may have not done the right thing in the split second. Mm -hmm. So as you say, mm -hmm. your question is different from mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I know about some of these experiments, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, about predicting uh, your future affective state. So uh, many people will say that it would be horrible for them to be paralyzed, okay? They think about the future. They don't, wouldn't want that. Very bad. But if you uh, ask people who've actually become paralyzed, they say, well, you know, I have a fine life and so forth. Now, the thing is that um, uh, what we have to be careful about is thinking that your feeling of well-being, and you said it, would I feel horrible if I pushed the man over the bridge? That's not the important issue. <laughs> the question is whether you've done the wrong thing, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. not always the template of whether, you know, how you feel. Similarly, the person cannot walk. The fact that he adapts in a certain way or tells himself certain stories about how it's not important to walk. You can do lots of other things where you don't need to walk. The fact that we can perhaps delude ourselves in a certain situation, right, 
is not an indication that, for example, if people come into the emergency room and some people have severe headaches and another person will have spinal damage, that I should say, well, treat the person with the headache because he's really in pain. The other guy, he'll be paralyzed, but he won't be in pain, and his psychologically he'll adapt very quickly. I think that is absolutely the wrong decision to make because there's more of an objective criterion besides, there's something else besides how you feel that is relevant to whether you're living a good life. Well, let me give what I think might be a fairer example. Suppose you're the physician who has to decide um, uh, how much to treat someone who's going to become paralyzed or someone with another quite severe disorder that's more difficult to adapt to. Um, I think uh, people with certain digestive problems that have to, urinary problems that, that have to be dealt with daily um, are much more difficult to adapt to than other disorders. I think that's relevant information. And although there may be some self-deception and delusion among a paralyzed person, I think that's precisely what we can't predict is how much we will uh, adapt, come to terms with something. Um, I'm not sure I would use the term delusion as much as adaptation. Uh, but I think that's precisely what we find hard to imagine in advance. Okay. David, I saw that you had some objections to I would, no, earlier. No, I, I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, Eli was saying about uh, this, these different levels of mm. self. Um, talking about the self this way goes back to William James. He talked about many different kinds of selves and his self asking whether there was a self of selves, which he could know, and he had... A lot of trouble, all he came up with was some movements in his throat. And, um, but uh, this notion of reflective self-evaluation, which is directed to answering the question, who am I? Mm. What am I like? Who do I want to be? Um, now, this is a, a theme that Frankfurt picks up. It's a very interesting uh, process. You, you look at the desires that you actually have, and you ask yourself, do I want these desires? Do I want these desires to motivate me <clears throat> and to constitute my will? And you can do this with a number of uh, sort of de facto desires and uh, beliefs that you find in yourself. So persons are not simply given static entities, but they have an ability to shape themselves to a certain extent. Uh, <clears throat> but I wonder about who is there at the second order level asking who wants these, do I want these desires? Uh, and I just wonder if it gets you into a kind of regress into a third level and a fourth level and so on. Yeah, and that's what I is, mentioned before about, mm -hmm. you know, this can go on. You can have yeah. an evaluation of the values of the that you have right now. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Where does it stop and where is the self that you finally want to stick with and say, that's me. This is the self I want to be or I am. Um, There's a very simple solution, practically. I mean, desires never model themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there, there are particular instances where you, you frame yourself and picture yourself as having this kind of personality trace that you want to get rid of at some point. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where that comes from, but th that's what I'm interested in. But Would that be a problem if this wasn't this kind of monitoring super self that philosophers imagined at some point? If it, if it were different, if it were a bundle of different powers or instances mm -hmm. within myself, that would be okay. But the important thing is that we have this kind of tension between two levels, I guess. I, I'm going to give One myself level has another, authority. Uh, I mean, it's not just yeah. a conflict between different desires. The whole idea is that there's an authority right. that one level has that the other one doesn't. The question is, where does that come from? And where does it go? But, yes, How far right, up does right. it go? No, I, I don't uh, think this is infinite regress. Just take a case <clears throat> like, um, do I love my children? Do I want to love my children? That's the second order, right? So do I love them? That's the first order. I love mm -hmm. them. I care for them. I want to take care of them. The second is, do I want to be the type of person who loves my children? Yes, right? So then you affirm it. That's the affirmation of the first order of desire. Then you're saying, well, you could go on forever. Do I want to want to be the type of person who loves my children? And isn't there an infinite regress? It seems to me that you just, when you are satisfied, in this case, you're satisfied with yourself, with your constellation of desires, you realize when you're so completely convinced that no matter how much you would think about it, you are completely, totally up to the nth level but someone like satisfied Peter, with your constitution. But someone like Peter Singer, someone who thinks we should take a more impersonal point of view hmm. on ourselves versus others, will say, 
I do now think that it's right to care for my children. But really, should I care for them more than the other children in the world, mm. right? Given that objectively their status is equal, OK? And he thinks, I, th I don't want to attribute, all right, I take back the name. This is Peter Singer, fantasy person, all right? <laughs> Someone who takes the impersonal point of view will say, you ought not to want to be the person who loves your child more than someone else. Uh, now, that may be the wrong moral conclusion. But at that point, the, you have to argue. You can't just say, I find myself wanting to be this sort of a person. You've got mm. to give yourself a reason yeah. for wanting to be one sort of person rather than another. So you've got to start reasoning about these things. I'm going to bring in the audience here, because I think you've all uh, deserved your, uh, your shake. Um, <clears throat> here's the first question. Is knowledge of the self introspective process or more of what other people say we are than maybe we weight what people say against what we believe about ourselves? That was the, uh, the very kind of middle of the road solution. Um, who would like to uh, jump in on that one? Do you want to start, Tim? Well, as I mentioned before, I think there is increasing evidence that um, if you ask people close to us uh, to rate our personalities, they have a somewhat different view than we do of ourselves. There's overlap, of course. Um, and, but both of those views are good predictors of our behavior. So it seems that, that there's some element of truth in how we view ourselves and some element of truth in how others view us. And so I think um, paying attention to that is that how others think of us is, is important. I don't think it's terribly easy. We, we tend to think others see us the way we see ourselves, for example. Um, I've often wondered if there should be a new Hallmark Day where uh, it's called like Friendly Feedback Day or something, where our friends, uh, our friends send us cards with helpful hints of things about ourselves and uh, that we don't seem to know about ourselves. Um, there may be some benefit to that. You heard it here first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could I uh, just yeah, please. add to that? Yeah. Um, uh, I think we can learn a lot from Socrates, who mastered the art of dialogue, um, getting people to learn about themselves by coming up against Socrates' front of questioning. He was uh, brusque and arrogant and tough-minded and uh, uh, really put th people through the ringer. Now, this is you know, one particularly difficult form of self-examination is with another person. And I think... Uh, uh, we've inherited a, a tradition going at least back to Descartes, possibly to Augustine, um, where self-knowledge is thought of as uh, an activity that's pursued by the self, for the self, uh, <clears throat> and ultimately um, with, with the self's own resources. And other people their biases, their influences are sort of kept uh, at the side because they are sort of contaminating influences. So the best way to know about yourself is to retreat or to suspend uh, the influence of society and other people. And I think that's, there's, there are a lot of problems with that. Um, and I, I would say you learn about yourself in dialogue with other people. This is, at least this is one of the ways to learn about yourself. Not every kind of dialogue is conducive to self-knowing, but uh, there are some where uh, uh, the other person uh, is a, a presence that evokes a kind of honesty or truth, uh, truthfulness from you, which you might not otherwise have um, uh, been amenable to. The other is sort of a, possibly a witness, a moral witness to uh, your accounting, to your owning up, your owning up to another and learning about yourself this way. Uh, so I think there's a role for dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, not just interjecting what other people say about you, but other people serving as uh, foils and um, um, challenges uh, to, your, to your explorations. I think that yeah. you might have to be careful, though. I mean, especially if you are um, a member of a group 
that has been subordinated or uh, for whom there has been a stereotype for certain behavior, that what you may get back from others is the expectations mm -hmm. of a continuation of that position. Mm -hmm. So you should always question, and again, think about the reasons. You know, ask the other person, well, why do you think I should change in that direction? Give me a reason, OK? Because otherwise, you, you open yourself yeah. up to the possibility mm -hmm. of uh, self-diminishment. Mm -hmm. That's the, the point about uh, the nature of the, the ideal partner in dialogue. I mean, Socrates wasn't a friend to the people he was investigating, right? Tim was talking about friends, but you know, you don't put your friends to death for corrupt, for, for being really annoying, which is what the Athenians did to Socrates. <laughs> this might, this, this, you know, telling your friends what you really think of them day might end rather badly. <laughs> But um, so what is the, David, if I can ask, what, how is this dialogue different? You mean, it's not the dialogue of therapist and patient, according to you. It's not necessarily a friendly dialogue. It's not a dialogue with someone who has preconceptions about you. So what type of dialogue is it? Well, I should say, I, I, I think um, perhaps there are psychotherapeutic and psychiatric dialogues which strive towards this, but they get trapped up in technique technology, manipulation, um, goals that are foreign to the person. Uh, but no, I, I think some, some dialogues are quite, probably quite rare, are spontaneous, uh, sort of unpredict unpredictable. You have no idea where it's going to end up and how you're going to be changed, but you are changed. Uh, a blind spot uh, that has been preventing you from seeing yourself, some, some really basic dimension about yourself, has been removed by the challenge of the presence of the other person. So it's being open-ended, in part. Yes, it's very much an open-ended dialogue, and it's being open to another person. I think there's another point, I mean, is, is that most of the insights we get from other people, from the feedback of other people, comes through uh, problems of ethics. Like, you're, you're behaving in a certain way, it infringes upon my rights. It's never, I mean, most often it's not worded like this, but it comes down to a problem of you know, what you're doing to me or to us is a problem. So it's really an ethical feedback. It's not an insight in your inner psyche. You know? you're, I mean, you're, you have a privileged access to whatever happens in your mind. That I, I'm convinced of this. And the kind of feedback you can expect is directly a, a moral or ethical feedback. So it's, it's, it directly contributes to this self -model, ethical self-modeling. So it's interesting in, in that particular way. I'm, I'm not expecting very deep, uh, insightful feedback on my inner personality from people. I'm really mapping out my relationship with others in terms of rights and you know, what, what am I doing wrong to you? Mm. Sure. I wanted to ask uh, the psychologists here, uh, there are certain techniques that are used, mostly uh, in the Eastern traditions. For example, mantra meditation, which has been studied by Western scientists. Sometimes it's called the relaxation response, sometimes it's more sophisticated. And people who practice these techniques find that um, a lot of the inner chatter, the conflict about what should I do, which should I go this way or that way, tends to go away. And there is a sort of a confident sense of what one really wants to do or what one really should do. Um, simply not as a result of dialogue, not as a result of introspection or inference, but simply as a result of using a very mechanical technique that seems to affect a certain part of the brain. Um, do you think that if someone were to be, have a difficulty in life figuring out what should I do, if the reports of these effects of the mantra, for example, are true, that this would be a way to discover what you really do want to do? Very interesting question, and I, I should say I'm no expert on the research on this, but my, my reading from somewhat of a distance is meditation of these sorts can be very useful for, for turning off the chatter and, and for achieving some um, at least temporary peace of mind. Uh, whether it actually gets us more in touch with somehow our true desires, I'm not so sure about. I mean, if, if what it's doing is turning off the sort of bad introspection that's confusing us and, and misleading us, then perhaps. But not, I don't think, giving us some sort of direct pipeline into okay. something that's, that's true. Okay, so Thank I have you. another question here from the audience, uh, <clears throat> which is, what are the principal obstacles to gaining self-knowledge? Who wants to tackle that one? 
way Jack Nicholson answered this question. <laughs> you can't handle the truth? You think that's the... Can you elaborate on, <laughs> on no. Jack Nicholson? Now we've quoted the great Jack Nicholson in the same breath as Descartes. <laughs> You know, the interesting paradox is that, I mean, to come back to this notion of imperious self, is as, uh, the, the more we gain knowledge of this personality within us, which we want to get rid of, um, the more we gain knowledge, the, the more difficult it becomes in a way. But uh, because this, this personality in us is also what, I mean, it's, it's, it's what prevents us from facing the truth in a way. It's all the you know, self-justifications, rationalization that we give ourselves in order to avoid the ethical problems, to avoid framing problems in ethical terms. But uh, as the process unfolds and we get to know uh, ourselves you know, uh, more, um, well, I would say this, this impediment, this obstacle fades out. I mean, if you, it can really become a, uh, a very interesting process. You can really get some, uh, some taste of self-knowledge as a very interesting, you know, passionate activity, I guess, at some point. That would be the, maybe the natural solution, that the obstacles just, uh, at some point, so disappear. The, the obstacles are that are des we don't desire the truth, or, are, or desires know that somehow some part of us knows it would be frustrated if it becomes, if it's made conscious. Yeah, the, this so it's egoistic surface level of the self, uh, which is driven by self-interest, has no particular interest in knowing what it is acting for. So, but I think it is, it's, it's the, the problem naturally uh, uh, is, is solved in a natural way as soon as you start practicing. That is, modeling yourself in those terms and experimenting on you know, what you're able to transform, the parameters that you can alter, and, which is the process of ethical self-transformation, I guess. I guess there's no, I, what I mean is there's no principled a priori obstacle to self-knowledge. I think it's merely a matter of getting in the process. Well, I, I will mention one that Francis alluded to that, that I agree with, which is that um, our culture gives us lots of expectations, um, stereotypes about who we are supposed to be or who we ought to be. And it can be difficult to see through that smoke screen sometimes, mm -hmm. to, to see that that's not who we are. We have certain traits or desires that don't conform to those cultural expectations. Um, that can be very difficult to sort out uh, sometimes, and it takes um, a lot of good self-observation to do so. Here's another obstacle. <clears throat> very simple observation. It's, a, it's a, as close to a truism as I can get. Uh, reality is richer and more complex than we can ever figure out. And that includes ourselves. Uh, I think the self is just enormously complex. Um, it's causal history, it's developmental history, uh, various um, components of the self and their interrelations with one another, just really complex and it's hard to figure out. Uh, there is one other obstacle that comes to mind and that is this. Uh, in some respects it's easier to remain uh, self-ignorant or self-deceived. Um, and in fact, uh, Tim, there's research, you know this research on uh, creative self-deception and, and depressive realism, the research seems to be showing that uh, people who maintain creative self-deceptions uh, about their abilities, their looks, their talents, their future, and also positive illusions about themselves tend to be uh, more adjusted, uh, uh, better health, um, uh, Better, but just uh, better off than people who have a kind of sober, realistic, truth-tracking, accurate self-knowledge. Um, I don't know how the research stands up methodologically, but, but it's a very interesting idea. And so the authors of this work, uh, uh, Shelley Taylor being one of the main ones, actually defend the virtues of creative self-deception over accurate, self-knowledge, so um, that's yet another obstacle. It's perhaps just easier and uh, more conducive to well-being to be self-deceived. <laughs> Francis? What, what I wanted to say was somewhat in the same line, though a little bit different, that is to say, if you are succeeding at the things that you value and you are interacting successfully with others, 
um, it would seem that that is, in a sense, an obstacle to your investigating yourself. I don't think it's a bad thing because ultimately you're investigating of yourself if you're not just a scientist who was wanting to, you know, give an adequate, you know, diagnosis of yourself, is for another purpose. It's for succeeding in what's important and getting, a, you know, successfully dealing with other people and living up to, to values. And if you're doing that, all right, then you're doing the most important thing. And it seems that you needn't investigate this, this other part, this other aspect. But the, the question that I want to say, bring it back to sort of the, the, the investigation that the philosopher of my sort who deals with these hypothetical cases, in finding out why exactly do I have that intuitive judgment, forget about the truth of it, the objective side of it, um, the rush to judgment. People are always thinking that, oh, it's this factor, and I finally found it, okay? And tomorrow a okay. counterexample comes up. <laughs> so. Uh, one of the obstacles, you know, there is that it takes a long time and it can be hard and the tendency is to want to say, I found it. <laughs> so this, this one other question which brings us up here, I mean, you mentioned and others mentioned firstly that the, if I could try to summarize it, one is the uh, self-knowledge is really uh, only should be, it's, it's an effortful enterprise, right? We can, we have to make inferences, we have to try to see ourselves the way others see us. Um, we can engage in the, in the process that, uh, in, a, in a difficult dialogue with an unpleasant Socrates. Um, why do it well only if it'll make you more successful at, the, at, the, at your projects or figure out really the right projects to pursue? So this person says, knowing yourself in order to make a change or a decision seems less important to me than doing so simply in order to fully know yourself for the sake of doing so. Isn't there just a value in knowing yourself full stop without having these further purposes? There's so many things we could know about yeah. the universe. I'd rather know the cure to cancer than to know about myself, I think. Uh, yes. So... <laughs> Uh, you have a choice to That's make about what you know. That's a very instrumentalist view I'm sensing. I'm very, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> the important thing is to be a good self, right? And if someone were a really good self, you know, Dostoevsky has these characters, right? I'm not an expert in Dostoevsky, but the idiot, you know, just doesn't realize anything. It's not very self-reflective, but acts from the best motives mm -hmm. and responds to others and so forth. Um, to be a certain sort of person rather than to know that you are that sort of person. I mean, Bernard Williams has this phrase, one thought too many, uh, <laughs> that, you know, um, to be a Tristan rather than to say, I want to be a Tristan, you know, uh, too much reflecting on what it's good to be is, is an unnecessary factor. But, you know, someone may in fact be intrigued by the whole idea of, human personality, you know, that we reflect on ourselves, that we have consciences and so forth. But then it's not so much an interest in yourself, but in self-knowledge. So when Professor Wilson said he thought self-knowledge was such an important topic, he didn't immediately consider himself. He just thought about the topic, mm -hmm. you see, and that, those are different issues. Yeah, I, I would second that, and I, I think there's some recent research of which I'm fond that shows that if the goal is to be happy, that actually an other focus and helping others and doing volunteer work is a more is a better path than sitting around navel gazing. So it depends what your goal is, but if it's to be happy, then an outward focus is often a better path. Well, on this uh, surprisingly <laughs> instrumentalist note about knowledge of the self, I think it's a it's a good time to uh, to end, especially since we've just been invited not to navel gaze too much. And um, uh, I, before ending, I do want to thank all our, our panelists for their uh, contributions. I'm sure you want to join in thanking them.